called the orbital, uh, within, within which is a diagram called the Seal of Secrets of the World. And um, I, I am a fantasy fiction writer, um, and I kind of uh, weave my interest of Vedanta and mysticism and Western mysticism and occultism into my fantasy fiction. I write under the magical name of Swara ZSD23. <laughs> and my nonfiction book is called The Seal of Secrets of the World Adventures in Astral Magic. So now I'm working with these two different computers. Okay, so the Orbital is, as, again, as I mentioned, a 16th century magical book. I lost my place of man. It's a 16th century magical book. It was printed on one of the first, world's first printing presses in 1575 in Basel, Switzerland. Um, it's, it's translated, it was written in Latin and then translated a uh, century later into English by Robert Turner, which was, was a Cambridge scholar. Um, and the most recent historical person that the Orbital mentions is Paracelsus, who lives during the first half of the 16th century. So it's thought that the Orbital was, was published within a few years of when it was written, and that means with a lot of magical books, there's this idea, are, are they forgeries? Were they written in the 19th century? Whatever. So maybe not. This is probably authentic. It's written within a few years of having been published. Um, although the prologue of the book says that the book is made out, out of nine chapters, uh, only one exists. And that is uh, the introduction. But I feel that the Orbital, and we'll talk a little bit about this during my presentation, is a steganographic text, I meaning it's a text layered with codes and secrets and whatever that you have to really dig to get to and find all the symbolisms and the codes. And, um, and I believe that all of the nine chapters are probably embedded in that first chapter. I have no evidence for this, but this is what I think, and perhaps someday someone who is an expert in Latin and steganography can figure this out. And these are the... Oh, here, here. Here, here, yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> two, two different these are what all the nine chapters are supposed to be about. So the first is called the Isagog, and it is an overview. The second, the author says, is about microcosmic magic, and he uh, describes microcosmic magic as being in contact with your diamond. We talked about that yesterday. The diamond, your holy guardian angel. Um, the next... Um, the next chapter is said to be about Olympic magic, and that is uh, planetary magic. And I'm going to talk a lot about the Olympic spirits, about what Olympic magic is in my talk. Um, the, yeah, and it's about evo uh, evoking the planetary intelligences. The next chapter is on Homeric magic, or Hesiodic magic, and the author says that that is about working with tutelary deities or benefactors, and he says that it's similar to Druidic magic. The next chapter, the author says, is about Sibylline or Romantic magic, and he says this is, no, actually, actually I think he says this is similar to, excuse me, that uh, Homeric magic is about um, working with uh, spiritual allies and benefactors, and Sibylline magic is about working with tutelary spirits, and is similar to Druidic magic, but by Sibylline or, or Romantic magic, what he means is, um, seeing portents in the natural world, or uh, you know, seeing portents in the entrails of animals, you know, gutting an animal, sacrificing mm -hmm. the animal, and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. He says that the sixth chapter is about pythagoric magic, of course it magic, but he says it's about the sciences, physics, alchemy, who's alchemy in the sciences, um, and uh, other, other kinds of uh, medicine, other kinds of arts. Um, the next one is called, uh, oh, he says it's Apollonian magic. And that's a reference to Apollonius of Tyana, who was a Neo-Pythagorean leg legendary Jesus figure. He was a miracle worker, um, so this chapter apparently is about thaum thaumaturgy, uh, miracle working, and uh, the author also says this is microcosmic magic. The next chapter, uh, the author describes as Egyptian magic, and is in wording it's relating to theurgic magic. And then the, the final chapter, he says, is prophetic magic. He calls it the magic that relies, that depends solely on the word of God. And given the jargon, he's the author's probably referring to 
Kabbalah, although he doesn't overtly talk about mention Kabbalah or anything in, in the uh, in the in it. But I believe that he, the, there's a lot of Kabbalist influence in this book. Now, my next um, Arbitol, The word Arbitol comes from the Hebrew, and it means uh, fourfold God. You touch a ground a ton. Um, and um, author E. Waite, in his treatise on the Arbital in the Book of Ceremonial Magic, notes that nothing Judaic or Solomonic uh, is mentioned in the Arbital, and that the, the name Arbital probably refers to a revealing angel. But um, especially as I was putting together my slide deck and revisiting stuff that I had written years ago, I believe that it probably is a reference to uh, some kind of Kabbalistic influence. Um, we also calls the orbital uh, transcendental magic, and he recognizes that it's different from other uh, magical texts, um, and uh, that basically rely on Solomonic ro Rosicrucian and Enochian magic. Um, the orbital also kind of, kind of expresses a qualified dualism or a type of panentheism, where the idea is that everything that God is not something out there. That God and that, that existence exists within God. So pure monism is God is everything. We don't really exist. God is everything. You know, this is all illusion. God is everything. And then there's qualified um, dualism or qualified monism, whatever, uh, with the idea that um, that there's God and beings, and they all kind of exist within the, each other. Arbitol is most famous and most famously used for its discussion on the Olympic spirits. The Olympic spirits are the intelligences of the classical planets. Um, this diagram here is by a modern occult uh, artist named Asterion, where he shows all the correspondences. So at the center, actually I have a little pointer thing here. Okay. Here, uh, here's the, uh, the symbol of the planet, the name of the planet, the corresponding sigil of the Olympic spirit, the name of the Olympic spirit, the corresponding, uh, this here, symbol of the uh, archangel and the name of the archangel. All these archangels around here are all uh, you know, related to the, the days of the week and the planets. Um, the orbital says that the Olympic spirits are rulers of fate. Um, this idea in Roman uh, spirituality that the Roman gods of the planets uh, rule human beings at the, the kind of, everyone is kind of at the caprice of the gods. Uh, but also, uh, similar to Hermetic or Ophite or uh, Pythagorean spirituality, um, where is the, there's this idea that the human being um, uh, travels uh, across um, Psycho, psycho, say psychodramatic dimensions, kind of like the chakras. But in Western spirituality, those chakras, the chakras, quote unquote, were the planets. So the, the soul is moving across these psychodynamic sphere, spheres that are represented by the planets. Um, also about the orbital, it says that all of the Olympic spirits all reign, uh, kind of are um, archons of certain periods. Uh, they reign for four, each reign for 490 years. So this number 490 is probably symbolic of other things, but, uh, but, the, uh, but the, the writer says it first started in the age of Bethor, 60 years before the birth of Christ, but if you go back 490 years from then, what you end up is you're, you're basically at the time of when Pythagoras was alive. And there's a lot of Pythagorean and Neo-Pythagorean influence in the world. The orbital also um, makes references to the mansions of the moon, which are um, which is the moon in the 28-day cycle, and this was very important in ancient times all across the world in India and India and other places where um, people were very um, 
they, they kept track of where the moon was in every single day, thinking there were certain importance about this. You know, like today would be a good day to buy a cow and not marry a widow or get out of jail free or something. <laughs> you know, people were very concerned about these things. Um, and people, People don't turn to the orbital for that, but it's in there. And also, the orbital talks a lot about um, evocation of tutelary spirits and angels, and a lot of besides the Olympic spirits, and a lot of that goes unnoticed. <laughs> so. And here's the Seal of Secrets, and I have it next to an image of the mansions, one of the images of the mansions of Lincoln. Uh, the Seal of Secrets, the orbital says, the Seal of Secrets is. The use of the Seal of Secrets is that through it, you may know when the spirits or angels are produced that may teach you secrets they receive from God. And the Latin version does not, uh, the Latin version doesn't have an image of the Seal of Secrets in it, but it tells you how to draw it and says, it gives you these guides, A, B, C, D, about how to draw it properly. And it tells the reader to draw a square in a certain way and divide it into quadrants that relate to the directions of space. These are also the seasons and various other correspondences. Um, and each quadrant is divided into seven parts that presumably relate to the seven plants, the days of the week, etc. And then those are each divided into four, so you have 28 parts in each quadrant. Those 28 parts relate to the mansions of the moon. So you have the uh, mansions of the moon in each uh, quarter uh, related to space, seasons, and other, and other correspondences. Um, and so over here next to it I have an image of the mansions of the moon. And here, uh, mansions of the moon, uh, in Western occultism they use the Picatrix as the source to know about the mansions of the moon. So here are the names, the Arabic names of the mansions of the moon, their numbers, the astrological uh, symbols that they're associated with, and major plant stars that they're all uh, associated with. And here's another uh, way to look at it. Uh, I, cut, I cut up the seal in a different way. You see some geometry in there and more correspondences. The, uh, the names of the zodiac, the uh, corresponding angels. This is from Agrippa, pairing angels with months and uh, zodiacal signs, and then some correspondences of the of the quarters. Now, the Arbatella, at a certain point, it talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse: red, white, pale, and black. Um, and uh, what I think that may refer to is Al talking about the alchemical path to, um, I have my notes here, you know, the path of alch uh, alchemy, we're talking about the Gredo, Albedo, Sinitris, and Rubido, the, uh, the path to the great work. And here, um, in addition to being a mnemonic wheel, to chart the phases of time and the spiritual rulerships and whatever, uh, about how to, you know, to figure out how to auspiciously get through a day. Should I buy a cow today? Should I wait until tomorrow? Will I get out of jail? Should I go to sea? All these kinds of things. Um, in addition to that, I believe that di the diagram is a cube of space that describes uh, a holographic and psychospiritual cosmos. <laughs> And so it's, it's that you're in the planets, and the planets are in you, um, and the planets are archetypes and mind states. Um, so a cube of space is somewhat similar to the Indian idea of a, of a yantra, in which the ge it's a geographic diagram where the lines and shapes have a certain meaning, and uh, it, it's like a psychospiritual map that, you, um, that the initiated person understands and travels across with their mind and it reveals truths about the nature of reality and the self. And here are some samples of things that maybe we can think of as cubes of space and as yantras. We have Sri Yantra here, we have the Tetractus. This is the um, traditional cube of space according to the Sefer Yetzera. Um, uh, to speak about this beyond my scope, there is a, a website uh, Psyche.com, where this person goes into this in extreme detail. Uh, Metatron's cube up there and other alchemical symbols. The, one, the symbol up over there is uh, kind of a pattern about um, uh, 
Valentini Gnosticism about the descent of how we get from the Pleroma to us, sort of thing. Um, to understand or read the diagram, you need to be initiated into what each line and plane mean uh, and how they interact with each other, how your how your eyes move across <coughs> the uh, move across the map. We'll talk a little bit about a uh, bit more about the spirits. The article says there are seven different governments of spirits of Olympus to whom God has appointed the governance of the whole entire world. And then he gives a pecking order. Aratron rules 49 visible provinces, Bether 42, Hal Lake 35, Auk 28, Haggath 21, Ophiel 14, and Pool 7. And here are the, the names of what all these, uh, the familiar, familiar names of what these Olympic spirits are. The pecking order, one, seven, two, one. Um, um, throughout the orbital, uh, the writer uses number codes, and um, sometimes when I first started reading this, I just thought, what, you know, whatever, I didn't care about this stuff. And as I got deeper into it, I realized that all these numbers had certain meanings and um, understood them in, as far as geometry and as far as how they relate to a deeper meaning of the seal of secrets that I had shown you before. The Arbital calls the, uh, the Olympic spirits, as I said, the governors of fate. And although it's full of pious Christian rhetoric, it contains passages that suggest a lean toward Roman thought, as I said, and also um, other spirituality where the planets uh, are similar to uh, how a, a yogi in the East would think about the chakras. <laughs> and, um, Um, the sequence of ascent of the planets in the orbital is more similar to as it is in the Kabbalah where we have the elemental sphere here toward the, the base and the, uh, the, the more, uh, the celestial sphere, uh, Saturn makes, uh, actually Saturn, the idea of Saturn is up, uh, exalted up toward the uh, higher part of the, of the uh, hierarchy whereas in um, Alchemy, sometimes Saturn is considered you know, this evil gatekeeper that keeps you bound to Earth. Uh, and we don't see that in, in the Arbiton. In fact, um, it's more similar to Platonic thought, Neoplatonic thought, where, um, where Saturn is exalted as um, godlike. And, and in fact, I have a, a passage here from um, the Plotinus' uh, Fifth Iliad The archetypal world is a true golden age, the age of Kronos, who is the intellectual principle being the offspring and exuberance of God. It goes on and on, but I won't read the rest of the passage. Whose translation is that? Of Epiphany. Who's, who's, who's okay, translated? Who translated? Um, I, I, I don't have it with me. I don't know if it was McKenna. Oh. I don't have it oh, okay. um, in front of me. So. I can get that information for you, but I, I don't have it in front of me. Um, here, again, uh, the, the Olympic spirits are both um, archons as well as archetypes. The, the Arbitel goes on and on about their characters and their powers, and a lot of powers are archetypal in the way that we think of archetypes and planets. Um, uh, I should say that in the, in the spring, I'll go a little backstory. In the spring of 2010, I um, began to experiment with the Arbitel, not with the Arbitel, Exactly, but with the sigils, I was scrying the sigils of the of the orbital doing evocation magic, meaning that I was meditating, I was staring at you know whatever one of these things and meditating on it and and, uh, and uh, recording my impressions. And I did that for a month, and I I uh, meditated on each uh, Olympic spirit in relation to the, you know their day. So you know Tuesday was. Uh, was phallic or Mars, and Wednesday was Mercury or Ophion, that sort of thing. And uh, I had some interesting experiences. Uh, I put my experience up on the web, and then a bunch of other people that were interested in the same thing got in touch with me and said, hey, you want to work on a project with us? I said, sure. Um, and what we did, should I get into that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, you know, it's here. So in any case, uh, let's get, I'll well, backtrack a little. My, what, my take-home message after that first month of working with these things was that 
there's a higher magic of the oracle that is to acquire transcendental wisdom and to have a wisdom-seeking approach to this embodiment and uh, its place in the multiverse. So these pictures, some of these pictures here are sort of related in a nutshell of what my experiences were with the uh, scrying the Olympic, Olympic spirits, my relationship with the Olympic spirits. Um, I'm not here to, to just talk about what they were because my whole point when I wrote my material is that everyone else, everyone should have their own experience. So go home and meditate on, you know, whatever. I'll get, try to get in touch with uh, Venus, uh, Haggith, the ruler of Venereal, as we were told. And, uh, you know, find out, find out something about yourself and about the universe by doing it. So, what happened then is I got in touch uh, with some other people who did some dream work. Well, I, I should say what happened in, my, in that first month that I was working by myself, uh, in part what, what was happening is I was seeing a lot of geometric images and getting little messages about geometric images. And this is just kind of a slide that shows some of my notes. And, you know, one day I was, I was meditating on Jupiter and the word tetractus came to mind. I wrote it down there. I've heard that word before, so I had to look it up and find out what tetractus was and, and other various things. Um, when I began working with the group, uh, we were doing uh, we were doing dream work. Last night at dinner, we were talking about dream work. And we were doing dream work, so what we would do is every night uh, we would go to sleep. We all lived in different parts of the world. We would go to sleep, and as we were sleeping, falling asleep, we would meditate on a, a, a sigil of, of Olympic spirit that was related to the whoever, whatever was ruling the mansion of the moon that day and then write down the notes. And in part, what happened for me is that all of the, all of the, uh, all of the geometric shapes that I had seen the month before and all the numbers in the, in the uh, orbital started to make sense. And I started to plot out um, this something related to the Seal of Secrets. And my friends that I were, was working with thought this, they were very amused by this. And at one point, someone sent me a picture of the mound building, building scene from the uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where he was obsessed with something was building a mound in his uh, living room, and that's how I kind of got when I was working. <laughs> so here's the seal of secrets, and so I'm going to talk about how how I got from this to this idea that all of the uh, Olympic spirits live in this, and that it's supposed to be uh, visualized in a, uh, not in a two-dimensional way, but in a poly, a multi-dimensional way. Like, try to see this 3D with all kinds of stuff happening inside it. Um, and also that uh, this, this thing is that represents you and your body and your soul and yourself. So here. So the first Olympic spirit is called Fool, and that's Luna. And Fool means flower in Sanskrit, and it represents the elemental sphere. So I am putting that right in the center at point A. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the Arbitral discussed seven wisdoms that probably relate to this whole sequence of the Olympic spirits. And it says, um, the lowest in the hierarchy of the seven wisdoms is the wisdoms of the elementals. Called fool. Now, we, as I said, fool means flower in Sanskrit. The Sanskrit word for um, moon is soma. Soma is the Latin word for body. So this may seem convoluted, but it may have been deliberate, and it was a practice uh, for medieval uh, occultists to use mashups of words that were from different languages, including Sanskrit. Um, the article says that the Fool, Luna, makes men live to 300 years. Uh, this statement probably means that the, the elemental sphere, Fool, is related to the terrestrial sphere, which is ruled by Venus, whose number, whose value is three. Let's go next to and the next, uh, the next um, wisdom. Uh, the second class wisdom is said to be that of the angels and the ministers of hell, or that is the heights to the depths, which suggests a reference to Mercury, called Ophio, or serpent of God in the orbital. Um, and of course, that word brings to mind the idea of the caduceus 
uh, Secret Fire, the Azoth, those sorts of things. Um, and so, as Mercury, it's the thing that connects the microcosm and the macrocosm. So it's, uh, in my image, I decided that it's all these rays. Um, Mercury, or Ophiel is said to rule 100,000 legions, and if we do a little algebra, we get um, this 8 times 12.5 is 1,000. And this equation here tells me how to, where to, where to find uh, Ophiel in here, uh, cutting the uh, seal into eighths. Um, and those eighths divide the, the four quarters. The so 12 may relate to the solar year. Uh, which relates to the um, the Olympic spirit that's that's related to the sun, which is this outer circle. What's the figure on the, on the bottom? This figure is Toth. So here we have we have a Mercury up here, and then this is um, this is Toth. So what what time period did that image? Oh, I mean, this is this is something that I had I had just put here to um, to illustrate my slide. You know, Mercury, Toth, they're, you know, they, they, you know they're, they're, they're cognates, basically. Um, and here's the, the planet Mercury. It was, it's just my design on my slide. <laughs> um, and then we go from Mercury, we go to Venus. Uh, Venus uh, is called, uh, the, the intelligence of Venus is called Haggith. Um, and Haggith uh, is a word that comes from the Bible, it means festive. Haggith was the, one of the wives of King Solomon. Uh, one of the wives, yeah, no, one of the wives of King David, whose uh, son, Adonijah, which means beautiful, was executed by his half-brother Solomon, who was executed because he coveted one of his King David's concubines. Uh, so this whole melodrama may be a reference to Venus as Lucifer, and the, the whole idea of the fall of Lucifer because of his rebellion. And um, so that's, again, it sounds convoluted, but this is how I, I believe uh, the author starts playing with these names and what these things mean. Uh, Haggath is said to rule 400 legions, and here 400 may relate to the four quarters, and I have her here as the screen circle. Uh, four quarters, the four quarters are ruled by uh, princes. Over every thousand, he ordained kings for their appropriate season. This is what he says of the Haggad. Um, and then the next. The next is uh, Ak, yellow, Saul. Uh, Ak is a Greek word meaning yellow. Um, and Ak is said to have 36,365 legions. So the number 365 refers to the solar year. Um, and at one time in classical era, around the third or fourth uh, century, it was associated with the Gnostic deity of Raxus. So I have a little picture of Raxus over there. Um, and uh, the number 36, uh, when I first was playing with this, I thought 36 were related to um, the eight rays of Ophiel and the 20 mansions of the moon, again, giving me a sense of where it was placed. However, it may relate to an equation by Plutarch, who felt that the number 36 was related to the Tetractus and uh, the idea of the whole in the world, and he got that by adding the first uh, for odd and even numbers to give it again, 36. To him, it's a single wholeness. Uh, Ak is said to give 600 years, and to me, I think that that uh, means that it gives um, a person mastery over the celestial sphere. It also relates to um, the intelligence of Jupiter, who's valid by six. And then next we have Mars, uh, um, and Mars is called Palak in the Arbitron. Um, the word means to, it's a variation, it probably means to divide and, and is probably related to a word also that appears in the Bible called uh, a character named Palak, who is a descendant of Abraham, and that word means to split or divide. Um, 
the, the wisdom, I was talking about these seven wisdoms, and I got a long way from that, but uh, the, the third wisdom related to phallic is said to be the wisdom of creatures, uh, the wisdom in corporeal creatures, meaning creatures living in the sphere of duality. Um, and uh, I already told you that, okay. Oh, phallic is called the Prince of Peace. Not a lot of information is given about it, just that it's the Prince of Peace. And I think that this may have a reference to the Tetractus, where the two points here um, are associated with duality and complementarities. And it says then, then when we get to three points, we get to this point, uh, it evolves into harmony and, and equilibrium. And the next one is the next, this, the, the next wisdom before the chief, as the orbital says, is that which is spiritual. And this is a reference to Jupiter. And the name, the word Jupiter actually means heavenly father. Um, the term, and, and Je Bethor is called in Olympic spirit speech, Bethor, which means, it's a mashup, it means house, house of gold. Um, and again, uh, Bethel is said to have 29,000 legions, and if we do, uh, again, a little bit of math, we get this, 8 times 3 plus, uh, 8 times 3.5. Uh, that, re that refers to all the space, this, all the space within this, this circle, how it's all cut up. Um, the, uh, the eighths, and then the, um, the, the, Half of the half, what they call half a prince and three nobles, meaning the one half of an archangel that's ruling um, each quarter, and then the three nobles that are next to. Them. And the orbital says that uh, Bether rules 42 kings, 35 princes, 28 dukes, 21 counselors, 14 ministers, and seven messengers. Basically, meaning that uh, Jupiter or Bether is uh, pervades this seal. Everything that's within um, the the boundaries, which is uh, Saturn or Aratron, it says that uh, Jupiter prolongs life to 700 years of God wills, and this may be a reference to mastering the planetary sphere and also its relation, the relationship of Jupiter or Bethor with uh, the final Olympic spirit Aratron, <coughs> which is Saturn. And here, Aratron, um, that, that, the opera also says, the chiefest wisdom is from God. Um, and here, uh, Saturn is equated with the intelligible principle. And Aratron, uh, it, the word is a mashup that means instrumental throne. And we were talking about, we spoke about the throne. Yeah. Um, Aratron is said to have 36,000 legions, and so again, uh, this is a reference to this idea of the whole, 36 being the whole, and, and uh, to attract this uh, spirituality. And Aratron is said to have 49 kings, 42 princes, 24 presidents, 28 dukes, 12 ministers, 14 familiars, and 7 messengers, meaning it completely fills space. <laughs> And so that is how I get from this to that. Um, you see the Olympic spirits within um, the seal of secrets. But after I was doing all this, um, when I got through all this, um, uh, of course, there's there's a lot more of it that's personal to me that is, you know it, it, it takes a lot to. It's not for now. It's, it's it's a big deal, you know, we go into all this stuff. Um, you know, I was thinking, well, okay, that's great, but what, is, what does that mean to me? Okay. Uh -huh. The orbital, as I said again, um, the orbital acts like, uh, or the seal of secrets is acting, is probably acting like a yantra that, once you can find where all these, what all these geometric shapes are in there, well, now you can, now you can meditate on this, now you can, you can think about, well, what does this mean to me? How, how am I related to this seal, which is a symbol of the microcosm, something that's holographic, and something that's important. So the Arbital tells us that magic is about being in wise communion with a range of tutelary spirits and angels at play in existence, and that it's best to evoke these entities in a simple and reverent way. Um, but 
the understanding that um, we're all united in our answer to a higher divine power God. Um, the entities aren't out there. Uh, they're in here. It's kind of like we're here, there, where is it? It's, it's kind of not local. Um, the Arbitral encourages the mage to ask the mage to ask the Olympic spirits that is being approached to teach me those things I need to know and to cultivate a firm faith and perseverance in interactions with the Olympic spirits and with tutelary entities, um, believing that those things will be fruitful. You know, this, is a, this is a friendly kind of thing that's going on. And then, because you are here. Um, in meditating more deeply on the nature of uh, tutelary beings and our relationship with them, we can alight on a deeper understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe uh, that may impact how we get along from day to day and what makes our lives meaningful. And finally, I have my little quote from uh, Joseph Campbell, all the gods, all hells, all heavens are within you. That God is within you it is not something that happens somewhere else a long time ago. It's in you. And that's, that's my favorite. Thank you, Jeannie. That's great. So, um, could, are there relations to uh, other traditions from the Arbitel from its time, perhaps? Like in the uh, Asian or um, other European traditions? Oh, it's, uh, uh, say that again. I, I other mean, relations between the Arbitel, which was published in, in the 16th yeah. century, to other, um, to other traditions that uh, come to mind? Um, I don't, I don't think so. As I said, I think there's a lot of um, uh, Neoplatonism and Pythagorean mm -hmm. spirituality mm -hmm. embedded in the Armatel, and yeah. uh, a lot of a lot of occultists have, Audrey and Waite yeah. specifically, have pointed out that the Armatel is very different from other magical books of its time. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's not. Most other, ma as you know, most other magical books are just <coughs> recipes. You know, um, or, or Solomonic magic is uh, here. Here's all these things you can do so you can get in touch with this demon or that demon. Uh, you know, draw a circle that's nine cubits and. Uh, ceremonial magic is, is extremely involved and uh, it, it's about commanding spirits, not about being in relation with spirits. Uh -huh. yeah. and, uh, you, know, okay. you know, I want to get, and, and actually people use the Arbatel in that way. Um, a lot of, I didn't, I haven't used the Arbatel in that way, used it in a much different way. But people, uh, modern, modern occultists that are heavily into ceremonial magic. Oh, okay. um, we'll, uh, this probably a cosmic message. <laughs> okay. Uh, they go about uh, doing this in a very old-fashioned way. Well, you know, they want a girlfriend, so they, you know, they uh, conjure uh, Haggith and then, or whatever. Or they want money, they conjure Jupiter. That's not how. how I work with them. And they do it very specifically. You know, they get up at you know two o'clock in the morning because that's yeah. when the planetary hours are happening, and they, you know, they set up their circle and you know. They, when I do that to myself, I end up falling asleep because I'm so exhausted about setting up the ritual thing that I can't, my head is not in the right place to be in communion with, you know, the other entity, which I don't think is another entity. Of course, I just think I'm dealing with my own archetypes or anything. I'm, I, or else I feel that I'm dealing with something that's very intimate, intimately connected to me, so it's not the sense of other or fear or I'm doing something spooky. No, I'm getting in touch with something that... I'm intimate, and we're all intimately, intimately connected to Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.